<laughs> All right, I'll start officially. My name is Jeremy Zawadny. I work at Craigslist. Uh, I'm here to talk about our search infrastructure and partly our real-time search infrastructure. And uh, there's my Twitter ID, JZAWODN, although it looks like Twitter's blocked on the Wi-Fi here or something. But uh, my GitHub profile, my blog, my email address. Uh, all these slides will be online on the conference website. I usually put stuff up on SlideShare when I'm done as well. So don't worry about jotting stuff down, at least if it's in the slides. Uh, I'll say a lot more than is in the slides, though. Um, so who am I? Uh, I've been at Craigslist since about 2008. I, uh, when I was hired there, my first big project was, was fixing search, um, which really meant fixing our databases, and I'll tell you why in, in a few minutes. Um, my background and kind of what I do there is, is a mix of things. I do a lot of Perl. Uh, I've been doing Perl for, God, 16 years or something like that. Uh, work on, I work on search, obviously. I do a lot with MySQL. Uh, Redis, MongoDB, uh, various back-end data services. So I kind of do data stuff. I don't do a lot of front-end work, uh, mostly because I suck at it, but um, also because it frustrates me to have like a billion different browser combinations to test with and all that. So anyway, um, I, I worked at Yahoo before that for about eight and a half years. Um, that was interesting. <laughs> and I also worked at Marathon Oil before that. Uh, I was the original author on the, the uh, high-performance MySQL book for O'Reilly as well. So. That's kind of the, the 20 seconds about me. Um, how many of you here don't know what Craigslist is? Yeah, that's kind of what I thought, okay. <laughs> so I'll tell you more about Craigslist as a company rather than what the heck Craigslist is. Uh, we have a very sort of engineering-centric culture. Uh, we don't have product managers or marketing people or anything like that. We just fired our, we just hired, not fired, God. <laughs> we just hired our first HR manager a few years ago. And I'll tell you, that was a huge improvement. Um, <laughs> We've got under 50 employees, so we're a lot like a startup in the sense that uh, what you do kind of can have, have a big impact. Uh, there's not a lot of room for, for, for slack there, basically. But we don't have the typical BS associated with larger internet companies with you know, layers and layers of people and all that kind of stuff. So we kind of have the best of both worlds. We've got the stability of a com profitable company that's been around for a long time, but um, the, the very small overhead, very small amount of process, so it's a lot more like a startup in that sense. Um, our infrastructure people ask about a lot since we've been doing this a while. We're all self-hosted, not our own data centers. You know, we lease space in a data center. We don't own the data center, but uh, we don't we don't do anything in the cloud. We don't have any virtualization. It's all like you would have seen 10 years ago. We rack servers. We manage them. We manage the network and all that stuff. Um, we don't really outsource much. Um, I think the. The extent to which we outsource anything is having some remote hands in our data center where we can go tell them to move cables around and stuff like that. Um, we are multi-data center. We've got two data centers right now working on a third one. And uh, you know, the vast majority of what we do is really driven by community feedback, user needs, that kind of stuff. Uh, we, we've got a huge you know, to-do list of things we'd like to do. And you know, we get to 5 or 10% of that every year and just kind of prioritize things as we go. But a lot of it has to do with watching how people use the site. and. Listening to complaints, listening to feedback, listening to other people's ideas, and just trying to decide what's going to work out, work out well and what's not. Um, and that's kind of where we go. We don't, we don't have some, some big business plan that talks about how we're going to monetize the site or you know, make the most of our users or something like that. So I'm going to talk mostly about search. You've probably seen our, our search interface before if you've used Craigslist. Um, a lot of people like to talk about the fact that our, our, our site looks the same as it did 10 years ago. Um, and to a large extent, that's true. But the reality is we've been sneaking in features over the, the years and, and months. Um, there are things that if you, don't, if you don't look real close, you won't notice changes. But um, there are things we've been doing. We added maps a year or so ago, which was a, a big thing, especially looking for apartments and housing and things like that, uh, garage sales even. And uh, even our search interface has been slowly changing as well. Um, you know, for an example, in autos here, we actually finally added a, a min-max field uh, so you could search for a particular year, model year ranges. Um, same with specific make and model. And we've slowly been adding more and trying to beef up our search infrastructure. One of, the, one of the bigger problems we have actually is kind of victims of our own success. People like to talk about the fact that our user interface is sort of static and it looks like it's Web 1.0 and blah, blah, blah. And people, you know, every year or two, someone comes up with this idea, oh, if I had to redesign Craigslist, I'd do it this way. And, you know, it looks great and it's very pretty. But the reality is every time we change something on the site, we've got some, some portion of our user base gets upset by it. 
they just don't like change or they don't like the change we made. And uh, so that's something we have to deal with is we, we can make changes, but we kind of do things very, very incrementally. Uh, partly we don't want to shock anyone, but partly because we want to make a change and watch and see if, how people react to it and measure what we can. You know, did it work? Did it not work? Uh, and especially in search because people use it so heavily. Uh, the other thing I'll mention is if, if you have questions while I'm going along, feel free to raise your hand, especially if it's something that you, you feel like you missed or would, um, would hamper your ability to understand the rest of what I'm talking about. So my outline for what I'm going to talk about is some of the challenges associated with search at Craigslist specifically. I'll talk a, a little bit about, well, about the history of search, kind of how we, how we went through various iterations of our infrastructure to get where we are today. Some of the lessons we learned, uh, especially in more recent years, and then uh, I'll take some questions at the end and, and give out my bag of swag. Can I ask you just a real quick context question? Yeah, go ahead. So while I was off getting the cable, so are you from here in, in Utah or Salt Lake? Or where oh, I, so I am from California. Okay. Um, all, all Craigslist employees are in California right now. Cool. Okay. Um, and, and actually that's an important point too, is I'm one of our remote workers. Uh, we have a few, few of us who telecommute most of the time. And uh, so I go to the office every couple of weeks. I live about three hours outside of San Francisco and the Sierra foothills. Sweet. Uh, we've got a couple other people who work remotely now too. Um, although remotely is defined as within California um, for various accounting reasons, I guess. Um, so the, the challenges we have with our search infrastructure, um, there's really a couple big ones. The main one is, is the, well the main two are the indexing rate or the, the volume of stuff coming in, how quickly data arrives. Uh, you know, we get something close to two million postings a day on Craigslist, which um, to some people sounds like a lot and to some people doesn't sound like much at all, depending on, depending on who you're talking to and what you've dealt with. But the fact that the stuff's coming in all the time uh, does make it interesting when you're trying to change things on the fly or, or test things out. Uh, because when you get behind, it, it can be very difficult to catch up in some, some situations. Um, the, bigger, the bigger issue really for us is, is kind of the churn rate and, and the half-life of a posting on Craigslist. This is something I hadn't thought about when I started tinkering with our search infrastructure years ago. And it's, you know, we have, when you post something on Craigslist, it can live for up to, I think, 60 days is the maximum, 45 or 60 days, depending on the city you're in. Some cities, it's only seven days if it's a very, very busy city. But the reality is a lot of stuff shows up on Craigslist and is gone within an hour or two or a day. Because, you know, someone posts their free couch and then 10 people contact, you know, I want your free couch, and then you take the post down five minutes later. That kind of thing happens all the time. So we have to deal with this, this churn. It's not like we're indexing a message board or a form where we're just getting new stuff in all the time. We're getting new stuff in all the time, but we're also getting a constant stream of deletes and a constant stream of updates because someone made a typo in their posting and have to change it, or the couch they just put up is gone, and 10 minutes later they have to take it down. So this churn is kind of going on all the time, and um, it, it's 24 hours a day. You know, people are posting stuff, getting rid of it. The same thing happens in, in the personals categories. You know, hey, I'm looking to meet someone, blah, blah, blah. They get 50 responses, take their ad down, that kind of thing. And our, our traffic is always increasing too. <clears throat> I thought when I showed up at Craigslist, I was like, oh, it's a fairly stable setup. It's very predictable. Uh, we, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's well understood because it's been around so long, and that's true. But one of the things we understood is that our traffic was still going up by some percentage every year. And um, <clears throat> it was not a small percentage. You know, you'd look at the graphs year over year and things were constantly increasing. So we kind of have to plan ahead and think about growth. Uh, not just in terms of the number of postings, but the number of people searching and the number of people searching at any given time. And one of the ways that's been problematic for us in the past is, um, in the last year or two, we've, we've introduced a couple features that I, I refer to as, as uh, sort of query multipliers. So if we're doing you know, 4,000 queries per second, that's fine. We can plan for that. We know how to deal with it. And we can test. But every once in a while, we'll deploy a new feature and, <laughs> and not really think about the impact it's going to have on the back end system because the person who deploys the feature doesn't really deal with the back end stuff and doesn't think about it. So I'll give you two examples of that. Uh, one is something I introduced a couple years ago that we refer to as nearby search. And what happens is you go to a category in Craigslist, you do a search. Let's say you're searching for some, uh, some motorcycle. And we only find like three or four listings. What we'll do automatically behind the scenes is, is rerun that same search against the nearby surrounding Craigslist cities and include those results and show them to you sort of below a little line that says, oh, these, we found very few matches, so we searched nearby areas and found these. And that was an incredibly useful feature because 
for people in smaller cities, they've always had to search their own city and then go to the big city and search there as well. So it saves people a lot of time. But what that does, it has, has the effect of, for some sizable percentage of our queries where they return below some, num some threshold number of results, we're gonna rerun that query again. We're gonna rerun that query against not one, but usually multiple nearby cities. So suddenly a single search that comes in on the front end turns into six or seven back end searches. And so we have to account for that kind of thing. Uh, another example of that is early this year, back in, uh, back in January, <clears throat> someone added a feature where when you searched in one of our sort of our top level categories, like you know, for sale, the general category, uh, you search for something very generic, you go to for sale and you search for um, Honda. What you'll find is that there are matches in lots of sub specific subcategories within Craigslist and there's a little category picker thing that appears at the top and lets you check a, you know, a checkbox next to all the subcategories so you can <laughs> include or exclude them from your search and kind of narrow it down. Well, in order to do that, we have to run your search you know, twice. We have to run it once to get a, a count, sort of, sort of, sort of do a count and group by so we can display all the categories and a little count next to them and say, well, there's 100 matches in autos, there's 50 in auto parts, there's you know, 30 in this other category and so on down the list so that you can see that. Well, the day that was deployed, it had the effect of, effect, that had the effect of doubling our backend query volume. And it happened at a particular time when there were other problems and it caused kind of a mini explosion that took a while to deal with and I'll talk about that a little later on. Um, so obviously one of the strategies we've had to deal with is to start spreading the load out, coming up with sharding and partitioning schemes and things like that. And those have also changed over the years, as you'd imagine. So the history of kind of where search has gone at Craigslist. Way back in the early days, when the whole site was like static files and, and, and whatnot, uh, it was sort of a Perl and DBM custom search system that they built in-house. This all way predates me. And um, it worked for a couple of years. And then as the volume of stuff grew, they, uh, they switched to using uh, MySQL full text uh, indexing. Uh, how many of you have ever used MySQL full text indexing with the MySAM tables? Okay. So you can probably guess what's gonna be on one of my other slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then I, when, I, when I got involved, I kind of took over at Search 2.0 and, and worked on the next three iterations. <coughs> We went to something that I called a, the, the Sphinx master-slave deployment, which I'll, I'll describe. Then our sort of version four was what I call autonomous Sphinx. And then search five, which is the one we're running today, is the real-time Sphinx infrastructure. So I'll go through these kind of briefly and, and explain how, how we made these transitions and why. Um, so why, part of the reasons why are we evolving this at all, like why is it changing? Well. You know, our needs and desires are changing. We've, like I said, we've got a list of things we'd love to do, and a lot of times it's just limited by our ability to, to sit down and build these features. But a lot of these features require new back-end services and, and flexibility we didn't have before. Um, Sphinx, which is our search engine of choice, which I'll talk about in a minute, is improving as well, and they introduced new features and was like, oh, we could take advantage of that. Great. Um, another big thing for us has been hardware upgrades. A lot of what we've done has been limited by the capability of the hardware we're using. And we, we do periodic refreshes of our hardware. We'll go through an entire data center and say, all right, it's been two, three years, you know, whatever the time frame is. Uh, we're going to sweep the whole thing clean and replace it with new hardware. So we'll go from one generation to another generation, and that opens up a ton of new capabilities for a lot of our services. And so we kind of look at it and go, all right, how do we take advantage of that? How do we improve things? And we go ahead and do that. Um, learning from previous mistakes is always important. So a lot of times we'll think about, all right, what didn't we like about the current setup and how do we change that when we, when we migrate to the new system? And, you know, it's fun to do new stuff. I mean, that's, that's part of what being a software engineer is about, is doing, doing things you haven't done before and trying new things. So um, that, well, there's a lot, of um, a lot of tinkering and experimentation that goes on behind the scenes. And uh, sometimes we do an experiment and it's like, oh, that's interesting, but not very useful. Other times it's like, hey, this is great. We should actually turn this on live for people and, and, and make it happen. Uh, that, that nearby search feature I talked about started as just an experiment. It's like, hey, would this work? What if we did this? And it was an experiment, showed it to a few people. And it's like, great, yeah, let's, let's put this out there. And um, the last reason is that <laughs> searching, searching is greater than browsing. Um, it wasn't until, this is gonna sound a little crazy, but it wasn't until fairly recently that people really looked at our data and looked at our logs to understand how people use the site in more detail. Um, for a long time, dealing with the infrastructure and the software at Craigslist was a lot, of, a lot about firefighting. 
it was struggling to keep up. It was an even smaller team. And, uh, you know, the site kept running, but it was, it, no one had a lot of time to go explore the data. When we did, we were shocked to find out how large a percentage of traffic to our top level pages and to individual postings came directly from search and not from people browsing the site. So that placed a new emphasis on, on, on improving the search infrastructure. So, like I said, um, we had MySQL full text search when I started there. And um, if you've used it before, uh, it has some serious limitations and we ran into them. Um, one of them is that we have this sort of manual sharding scheme. So Craigslist is, if you've used Craigslist, and most of you have, you know, there's a different Craigslist for every different city that we, we, we advertise. Um, I'm sure there's one for Salt Lake. I'm sure there, you know, there's one for Chicago, San Francisco, New York, Austin, and all sorts of places. Uh, today there's about 700 cities that we're in, I think. And uh, the sharding scheme back then is like, well, we can't put everything in one big table and index that because that's crazy. You know, my ISAM tables have table level locking and it's just the concurrency sucks and they crash all the time and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they had the scheme, you know, you could put all the data in, you know, one table per city, but it seemed like, oh, you know, one table per city, yeah, that'll work, but we don't want all the tables on a single set of servers. So they said, all right, one city per table, and then we're going to put different clusters of servers, and we're going to shard across those. So some cities are in this cluster, some are in this cluster, some are in this cluster. And that scheme worked fine. Um, it was generally resilient uh, until someone ran a query that would really bring them one of the clusters to its knees, and then all the other cities in that cluster were affected. But it worked OK. Uh, one problem with it is it was a, was a manual system. So if one city started to heat up or one city started to grow a lot, and this was several years ago. This is when we, we could launch new cities that had, didn't have their own specific Craigslist. And they would start to take off and really get a lot of traffic. And um, so there was this constant battle of, oh, do we need to move a city? Do we need to add more machines to the shard? How are we going to make that faster? Um, and performance, performance would often just sort of fall off a cliff. Things would be going and going and going, and all of a sudden just boom. No results, you know. It was, it, was, it was not a fun piece of infrastructure to deal with. Um, MySQL's full text search had very limited query syntax, didn't have a lot of the features people wanted. Uh, there wasn't much in the way of relevance and, and, and ranking and things like that. It was a fairly basic system, and like I said, we had problems with table corruption because it was, it was my ISAM tables. So, when I came on board, I looked at a bunch of other search software we could be using. I looked at Lucene, I looked at Sphinx, I looked at two or three others that I'm forgetting the names of because this was back in 2008. And uh, I settled on software known as Sphinx, um, which I think is confusing because there's something in the Python world called Sphinx, and I don't know what it is because I'm not a Python person, but a lot of times people see the names and confuse them. Um, but uh, we've been using Sphinx ever since 2008. It's, um, <coughs> it's, uh, it's open source software. Um, you can go download it. You can get all the source code, build it yourself. Uh, in my opinion, it's, it's awesome. It's worked really, really well for us. Uh, one of the nice things about it nowadays <coughs> is... Um, it speaks the MySQL protocol. So if you have client software that can speak to MySQL, you can talk to Sphinx. Uh, if you want to run a search, you can fire a select query at Sphinx and you can get results back. The, um, the indexing performance, uh, Sphinx is very, very fast. Uh, one of the benchmarks I did early on in my evaluation when I looked at various search tools is how, how quickly can they ingest new data? And this was on you know hardware circa 2008. Well, the hardware, <laughs> this was in 2008, it was like 2006 generation hardware. And I was suitably impressed at the time that I was able to get the kind of performance I could. You know, we were, we were looking at thousands of documents per second, which I was like, oh, great, you know. Because if we can do a, you know, a minute's worth of postings in a couple seconds, then we'll have no trouble keeping up with the volume. Um, similarly, the, the query times, getting data back out of Sphinx was, was ridiculously fast. Uh, I remember some of the first, some of the first benchmarks I did, I, you know, I went to our CTO and I was like, I was like, you know, uh, I'm not going to give you the conservative numbers. I'll just tell you my benchmark show. But I'm like, you know, we could run the entire site off like two servers for search. And he just kind of looked at me and didn't believe me because at the time we had, <laughs> we had 25 MySQL boxes doing full text search for us. And they were still falling down all the time. You know, they get behind, things would get slow, and you have to like turn search off for a little while, let things recover. Or they just get behind in replication because uh, that's what would happen. And, uh, and so tinkering around with it a little bit, looking at the performance, I was really, really happy with it. Um, in my opinion, it's very easy to understand, too. It's not a big, complicated system. It's got a very small number of tools that are, are sort of follow the Unix philosophy of having one tool that does one thing well. Um, 
I see it as a very programmer friendly tool. Um, you don't have to learn a ton of crazy stuff to get started with it. Uh, I literally could download it and start using it within about an hour, uh, and that was just that was that was fantastic because some of the other tools I looked at required a lot of setup, a lot of the learning curve was steeper. Um, and what I found is that the support for Sphinx is great. Um, there's a, you know a general bug tracking system, discussion forum, that kind of thing. But they also had something which we were interested in, which was they have a paid commercial support contract you can get. So you can pay them some amount of money every year, and then if you hit a bug, you either call them up or you put something in their, their private bug tracker where it gets priority, and your bug gets fixed. And um, generally speaking for us, Sphinx has been very, very, very stable. Having said that, I've used our paid support mm, half a dozen times over the last few years because we found bugs. And since we're doing things at a scale that a lot of Sphinx users don't, we find bugs that no one else finds. And it's like we, we run into some crazy bug and, and go back and forth with the developers, and they're usually able to fix it. Um, it's, been, it's been rare for a bug to go unfixed for us for more than a day or two. Usually it's a matter of just trying to get that reproducible test case so I can give them something definitive and say, here, this will cause the bug. And then once they do, it's like it's fixed usually within a day. So that's been amazing for us. Um, so I mentioned Sphinx comes with a small number of tools or components. Um, the first one is known as SearchD. That's the search daemon. That's the thing that runs all the time. Um, it is, it's interesting because you can run it in different modes. It's, it's sort of like a patchy in some sense. Um, you, can, you can run it in a multi-threaded mode. You can run it in a uh, pre-forking mode. You can run it in a sort of forking on demand mode, which is you know, horrible for performance if you get a lot of queries, but you can do it. Um, and uh, its sole purpose in life at least originally its sole purpose in life was to have a bunch of indexes on disk and queries would come into it and it would answer those queries and spit results back and that's all it did. Um, in newer releases when real-time indexing was added um, the search deep process got the ability to actually do I indexing of documents as they're added on the fly. Second tool is called indexer. It's a command line tool that's used for building batch indexes offline. When I did my original testing that was the tool I used. But it's just a small little tool, and you feed it. You feed it a pipe of data, or you can point it at a MySQL database, and it can query that database for you to build up indexes. Uh, if you feed it data directly, you can give it to you can give it TSV format. I think uh, we had to, back then the TSV didn't exist, so we were actually having to give it XML. Luckily, the XML required was very lightweight, and um, it worked very well. Uh, index tool is useful if you want to do just sanity checks in your indexes. Uh, this was useful for helping us find a couple bugs. Uh, and the last one was a, was a command line search tool that lets you just do one-off queries against your indexes and, and get some statistics and do diagnostics and stuff like that. But really that's kind of the whole package. I mean everything is very simple to understand. Uh, there's a single configuration file that uh, all of the tools understand how to read and lets you configure settings like character sets and indexes and names of things and, and every, everything you could possibly imagine all goes in the config file. So the first deployment I did for Craigslist was uh, what we called Master Slave Sphinx. And I'll, I'll show a picture of it in a moment, but you can probably imagine what it looks like. Um, there was one index per city, which means we ended up with about 700 indexes. Um, and initially this was all done on a single cluster of machines, if, if, if I have my history right. Uh, but eventually we grew by, by sharding into two and then three clusters so that you know, each cluster had half or a third of all the indexes. And the way it worked is the master servers would build indexes every roughly 10 minutes. And um, they just use that indexer process and a few Perl scripts that would query our database, build the XML, and spew all that data into the indexer process. And um, <clears throat> the way it worked is that indexing process would run for a couple minutes. When it was done, I would I would sort of create a version of the indexes on disk uh, by copying them to the, a certain place and putting a timestamp on them. And then those indexes would get copied to all the slaves. The slaves would pull them via rsync. And then each slave, once it got its new indexes, would restart itself. So basically stop search D, start it back up. And it went from having indexes from 10 minutes ago to having indexes from you know a few minutes ago. And that was, that was kind of the whole process. Uh, and back then I was using the, the pre-forking uh, this pre-forking configuration for SearchD, and that told us, you know, I said, all right, you're going to pre-fork 100 processes to handle the requests, and it scaled pretty well for us. It was it was really really fast. Um, to give you an idea of the hardware generation we're talking about, these were these were AMD Opteron processors with 32 gigs of RAM, um, and uh, 
basically effectively four cores. They were dual processor, dual core boxes. So this was not amazing hardware by any, by any stretch, but we were still able to index thousands of documents per second and, and query, well, I don't remember how many thousand queries per second we could handle, but I, it was in the thousands. And you know, we had a number of hosts doing this. And so here's a picture of what that, what that looked like. We had our primary database of postings. The master, Sphinx master, would query it. There'd be some custom code we wrote that would query it start that index building process, and then the slaves would get that data replicated to them. And then you know the web servers would just query whichever slave they wanted to, randomization and, and looking at the health of the slave and things like that. Very simple to understand kind of what you would expect. And uh, this worked really well for us. Uh, honestly, the, the, the biggest problem with this setup, two biggest problems with this setup, one was there was that delay. You know, we, we did things every 10 minutes, so you were not getting up-to-date data, but when people posted an ad on Craigslist, we always told them your ad will appear within 10 or 15 minutes or something like that. So people didn't have the expectation of <coughs> there's stuff instantly showing up on the site anyway. So it worked out well to build indexes every 10 minutes. Um, the, the bigger issue with this though was if this box died, it was a single point of failure. That master dies, none of the slaves get new data, you've got a whole cluster that's behind. Um, luckily it was easy for us to promote a slave. Uh, the master and slave ran identical code. Uh, it's just that the master knew it was the master, so it did the index building. The slave knew it was a slave, so it knew to, to pull data from the master. So to promote a slave to master was literally just a config file change, change a config file in our, in our management system, push that out, and then it just worked. Like the cron jobs that did the index building and the index pulling, just like, oh, okay, I'm a master. I'll know I know what to do. I'm a slave. I know what to do. Very straightforward. So then we got a hardware upgrade. You know that feeling, right? It's awesome. Um, <laughs> so, a hardware upgrade. Um, the new machines we got, these were, these were blade servers, 24 cores, 72 gigs of RAM, 300 gig solid state drives. Massive leap in performance over the previous setup. And I did some working on, on these machines when they came in, and I was just like, damn, these things are fast. They, are, they have so much more capability. I wonder. I wonder if we could eliminate the master-slave thing and just have every Sphinx host build its own indexes. And just, we'll call this autonomous Sphinx. It gets rid of the whole single point of failure of having a master there. And um, there's no replication delay. There's no copying of stuff all over the network, aside from pulling in the postings in the postings database. It also simplifies the code a lot because there's a bunch of stuff that just we wouldn't have to have anymore because we wouldn't have to worry about the distinction between master and slave. And it really would allow us to better utilize the hardware. Because what I found is that when we started deploying these things, it's like, yeah, the masters were, were really heavily used because I could just crank up the number of parallel indexing processes, use all 24 cores, great. But the slaves, they, you know, they were, they were kind of bored. Um, you know, we could greatly reduce the number of hosts we had handling queries from the front end because they were just that much more powerful. So I just got thinking about this. I like, I wonder if that's possible, you know. Turns out it is. <laughs> So that's what I built. Um, this diagram is basically what you saw before, except there's no master there anymore. Um, for historical reasons, mostly because of the way our, our host names are managed and whatnot, we still refer to these as slaves. There are just no masters. And um, every one of them would build its own indexes. Um, still happened in the same schedule. Every 10 minutes, a process would fire up, pull the latest postings, you know, changes, edits, deletes, in from the postings database build the XML, hand it to the indexer, and all the same process would churn through and it worked fine. And then, um, and then the host would restart, would restart its copy of SearchD and then magically when it came back up, that host had new indexes. Um, we had a little, little magic that would make sure that not all the nodes in the cluster were restarting SearchD at the same time, obviously, because then you couldn't answer any queries. Yeah? Well, you have the same infrastructure when you introduce the feature to search uh, nearby cities? The nearby stuff... That was long ago that I think it was on the previous infrastructure. That was on the infrastructure where we had the four core AMD boxes and, uh, and master slave sphinx still. And you were still indexing per city? Yeah, we still had one index per city. Yeah, so a front end query that came in would, uh, would potentially result in you know five, six different queries on the back end. Um, come up afterwards for a t-shirt. So that's, that's what we deployed was Autonomous Sphinx. Um, any, qu any other questions so far? Yes? 
So you mentioned that um, Sphinx uses the same interface as MySQL? It speaks the MySQL protocol on the network, that's right. Is it, was it very difficult to switch? Are they is it a drop in replacement or was it a lot of work? Um, it's, so switching is hard to say because the MySQL protocol in Sphinx didn't exist at the time that we adopted Sphinx. At the time we adopted Sphinx, it had its own proprietary protocol, which we used initially. Um, and nowadays, if you were just to switch to it, it's easy to switch from that point of view. Your, like your drivers, your client software are all the same because it, it just looks like a MySQL server. The trick is the query syntax um, is very different from you know, MySQL full text. MySQL full text is very limited. The query syntax looks like, you know, it, in both cases, you're, getting, you're, you're running a select statement, but the capabilities in Sphinx and the query syntax are a little different. You can write much more complicated queries in Sphinx. I don't think you could take a MySQL full text query, fire it against Sphinx, and expect it to work. I think the syntax differences are significant enough that you'd have to at least rewrite the queries. Um, but that's really not that hard either. Uh, it's a fairly simple process. Yes? That's kind of a two part question. Uh -huh. Most of what you're indexing is basically text fields, right? Or are there other so, yeah, so the, qu the question is most of what we're indexing are text fields and that that was true but it's becoming less less the case that it's only text because yeah every posting has a has a has a title has a body and then a little bit of other data like the the neighborhood if you specify the neighborhood you're in or something but behind the scenes there's also a bunch of attributes that go with that uh, things like your asking price um, Things like the the date, date and time, like when was the posting created? Um, what else? God, we've got tons of tons of attributes now that I can't even think of. But we um, we actually keep track in Sphinx of the name of one of your images. I don't think we count the number of images there. Um, but there's probably a dozen or two dozen numeric attributes that go with it as well. In terms of the search, though, the search is basically hitting. The, set, the, the text index. Yeah, primarily it's text index searching. That's okay. right. Yeah. And then, and then, so you've got the Sphinx handles not just the indexes, but the actual linking to the data side of it, just like MySQL would type of thing. Where are you hitting? What, what do you mean when you say linking to no, the data? What I'm saying is like in MySQL, like in my ISO, for instance, you've got an index file and you've got the data. Oh, okay, okay. I see where you're going. Yeah. So what happens in Sphinx is when you issue a query against Sphinx, what you get back is just a set of results. You don't get back the original data that went in. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, so every document that goes in has an ID. So you get back the ID. And then where does, where, and then where does the web server hit to get the real data? OK, so in, in our infrastructure, uh, we have a, a service that we refer to as our posting cache, which is a huge distributed memcache setup so that uh, every posting that's in our database is also in memory on one or more servers. Okay. So what happens is our, our web servers that handle search query Sphinx, get back a list of IDs that match a, a, a particular query. Um, and then they can turn around and send a batch request to our posting cache service and say, give me the full data on all of these. And or it's just really fast. And it's really fast because it's in memory, yeah. Right. Um, and it's all this, it's this big async system too, so it'll actually run all those in parallel and gather the results back. So you're only using Sphinx to basically to search the index and then turn around and hit them cache for the, for the, the data results, basically? That's... Um, mostly true. <laughs> the wrinkle there is um, when you add non-text fields to Sphinx, so Sphinx really has this distinction. There's text fields that you do full text indexing on, then there's other fields we call attributes. <laughs> and the attributes are typically numeric things that aren't indexed. But when you get results back, you get all the attributes for every match back for free. So what you'll do is you'll say, you know, find me all the cars, the car ads that contain Honda. And you'll get back a list of whatever, 100 ads, and you'll have the idea of that ad along with all the other numeric attributes as columns. So you might have the price, you might have the date it was posted, you might have you know, whatever other things are on there. Um, so those attributes come back for free. And it turns out you can also put in string attributes in Sphinx, um, which is just a, a blob of text, a string, that Sphinx will store. It will not index, but it will return it back to you. So one trick that we use is, um, this is an optimization that came along about a year after we deployed it, is we take the posting title and store that as a string attribute in a search index so that when you run a search, all of the data that is necessary to show you a search results page actually comes from Sphinx and we never have to query anything else. When we did that, it cut down our, our page rendering times, our, our response times for search, cut them in half 
because half the time was consulting Sphinx to get the list of IDs, and the other half of the time was turning around and asking our posting cache for the details. Well, we got rid of that posting cache step by storing the posting title in Sphinx as a string attribute. And now what happens is when you query Sphinx, you get all the data back necessary to show a results page, and boom, you're done. So you're, so you're storing data. You're storing data in your index. We are storing data in the. We are storing data in the index. It's just not indexed per se. Yeah. Or I should say, there's a copy of it that's not indexed because we do index the title. But from Sphinx's point of view, they're two separate fields. So enough data basically to build the initial result of that. Yep. Exactly. Did that wind up bloating up the size of your index much? That did end up bloating up the size of our indexes. Um, I won't say it was substantial, but it was it was measurable for sure. Um, so that's that's one of the reasons that. Over the years, we've had to occasionally sort of reshard our data and go from one big cluster to then two clusters, then to three clusters. Um, today, we have five clusters. So it, it's helpful because you, you, you know the memory footprint's going to get bigger. And if you can't easily add memory to your boxes, you can add more boxes and just shard the data better. OK, so real-time Sphinx. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Um, are you you tried to compare at Lucene and Sphinx briefly, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering uh, and you can talk more about the full texting. And I'm wondering uh, if Sphinx can provide uh, a kind of a contextual search and as well as the sentiment, uh, can you do the sentiment analysis on it? Uh, yeah, so the question is can Sphinx do things like contextual search, and including doing sentiment analysis at indexing time? And the answer is no. Um, it can do. Some things in indexing time, like um, stemming, for example, things that you definitely want in a search engine. But the, there isn't a sizable ecosystem of sort of plugins and extra stuff that sits around Sphinx like there is around Lucene and other things. Um, you know, things like Elasticsearch didn't exist back when I looked at Sphinx, for example. Um, but you look at what Elasticsearch does, and it's like, wow, it's got everything in the box there, right? Um, and I've played with Elasticsearch a little bit. One of the things that I still like more about Sphinx, aside from the fact that I know it better, is it is a very small number of moving parts that I, you can understand pretty well. Whereas some of these other larger systems like Elasticsearch, it's harder to understand what's going to affect performance when you make changes. Um, because there's just a lot more knobs, there are a lot more things you can twiddle. And, uh, and that's the trade off. And a lot of, you know, that's one of the things when you look at a search system, you have to decide what do you want? Do you, do you want the flexibility to do anything possible, or do you want the predictability of kind of knowing what the performance is going to look like and having a, having a feature set that you can sort of fit in your head and not have to always go back and look things up. Um, that said, I think there are some great applications for Elasticsearch, and we use it for some things internally as well. Um, any other questions? Yes. In your first slide, you basically had, I noticed you had MySQL up there, and you also talked about other data stores out there. Yeah. As far as you say, you say the syntax is similar to MySQL. Yes. What about the, the OSQL type environments? I mean, as far as interacting with those and their data. What, what, what does Sphinx support in that, in that realm? So uh, Sphinx can natively talk to MySQL and query your data to index it. Um, it can natively talk to, I believe, Postgres as well and pull in data. And I think it, it can talk to anything that has, uh, there's a generic set of ODBC type driver, so it can talk to other systems. As far as the NoSQL world, I don't know of, I haven't looked, I haven't, don't know of anything. When we started using Mongo a few years ago for some stuff, I talked to the Sphinx guys about, hey, Mongo support would be great. And I talked to the Mongo guys about, hey, it'd be great if you had a generic way for search engines to tap into the data stream in the replication log and, and you know, that kind of thing, trying to get the two parties to come together. And, um, I don't know the current state of the art there. I think that in, I seem to remember last year reading something that made me believe that the Mongo guys had added some features, or at least had some code available, I think it was some Python code, that made it possible to tap into the op log so you could effectively use it for search indexing by watching the data stream. Um, so using something like that, you could plug into Sphinx easily. Sphinx doesn't natively talk to it currently. Yes? Sorry, I hope hopefully I'm not deviating from our topic here. You okay. mentioned the Mongo DB and you mentioned the MySQL. Yes. And I'm trying to understand in your polyglot architecture, what is the specific reason of using Mongo DB? What are some of the use cases? So yeah, the question is, what are we, what are we using Mongo for? Um, and yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I didn't have time to put in the whole architecture diary on my Craigslist. So the simple answer I'll give you, and we can talk later if you want, is we use Mongo for our, our archived postings, postings that are no, no, no longer live. Uh, but are available in case you want to come back a year or two later and say, oh, I, that job ad I posted, the guy left, I need to hire someone. You can pull it back up. So we use Mongo as sort of a, 
not a cold storage system, but a warm storage system for our archive. Okay, so a um, couple of years ago, I ran into Andrew, the creator of Sphinx at a conference, and he started talking about real-time indexes he was working on. I thought, oh, this sounds great. This would be a lot of fun to, to use once, once they're ready. Well, last year, I took a serious look at it, and I said, you know, the real-time stuff seems to have really matured. Um, it would be great if we could use it because it would reduce the overhead from, from having to restart SearchD every 10 minutes because you've got to read all the stuff off disk, cache it back in memory. It was kind of, you know, it took like 40 seconds or whatever to restart SearchD. So to do it across the entire cluster of machines took a few minutes, which meant they weren't always in sync. And it was, there were a lot of little messy details there. Um, but the bigger thing is it meant it could reduce our sort of time from a posting going live to the posting theoretically being searchable from, you know, 10 minutes to like 10 seconds or less because it's real-time indexing. Um, it also would eliminate all of that XML code that I had to write to generate documents in a form that Sphinx understood. It wasn't a lot of code, but it was just, I didn't like having it there. Um, and this, the real-time indexes in Sphinx work with the MySQL protocol. So to put data into Sphinx for indexing, you use either an insert or a, or a replace statement. You know, insert into index name, blah, 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 or replace into if you're updating a document. It seemed too good to be true. So I was like, well, I better play with this and see. Turned out it worked great. And I was able to upgrade all of our stuff. Um, to give you an idea of what it looked like, it looked I almost identical to this. The architecture hasn't changed. So the only difference is the process, there's a process running on each of these hosts that's constantly looking at the postings database for new stuff and inserting it locally into the real-time indexes. There's no more restart to the search D. The search D processes run for days and weeks and months now. And um, there's almost no latency compared to our old system. Yes? Do you consider setting up the postings DB to actually uh, post data out to the slaves instead of having the slaves simultaneously query data out? Yeah, so the question is, um, wouldn't it be nice if this guy could push data to the slaves and they wouldn't have to, to sort of pull the database? Um, the answer is yes. In fact, the code I wrote that runs all the new code that runs on these guys, that our custom code that handles the, the real-time stuff, has the capability to take documents posted to them. You could sort of do a po HTTP post. So here's the document. Um, we're not using that right now because we don't have an easy way to make the database do that. But um, what we're actually thinking of down the road is, you know, I only drew a, a very narrow diagram here. The stuff over here, the front end that handles postings that then writes them to the database, could actually, when a user clicks publish my post, could actually simultaneously put it in the database and tell search about it at the same time. Uh, and that's probably the direction we'll end up going someday. So the real-time stuff worked great. Um, I can't say enough good things about it. I mean, it's worked really well for us. Performance has been great. There have been a few hiccups along the way. Um, before I jump into some of the hiccups and lessons learned, I know I'm running short on time, partly because of our cable snafu. Um, you guys, you guys can 11 minutes. I think you can just go right through 1230, right? Yeah, that's true. It's just lunch. No one's hungry. Yeah, no one's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so people often ask about our sync setup. Uh, what do your clusters look like? Is it all like one big cluster or is it all just a few shards? And the answer is we have different roles internally for Sphinx clusters. So we have one called Live Sphinx, or that's what we call it, which is that's the one that everyone interacts with when they come to Craigslist and do a search. You are hitting our Live Sphinx cluster to run a search. Uh, it's got the highest query traffic by far, um, highest volume, highest churn rate, all that stuff. That's primarily what I was talking about this entire time. Yes? You're getting a lot of deletes, so do you have to deal with like, conflict resolution? Conflict resolution, no, we don't. The database, from the point of view of the database, from the point of view of MySQL, a posting is only ever in one state at a time. It's either there or it's deleted or whatnot. And um, the, all of the operations in that database are, all of the operations in Sphinx are idempotent, so you could replay the stream, end up with the same result, not a problem. Um, internally, we have a group of Sphinx servers we refer to as our Team Sphinx, so team members at Craigslist can go in and look at things as well. Um, you know, we have a few extra search fields and a few extra capabilities that we don't make available on the website. Um, by far, it's the lowest traffic, and uh, but there's there's lots of extra data in there. Um, postings that have been deleted but are still in the database are searchable for us, that kind of thing. Forums, some of you may have seen the forums on Craigslist, uh, you know, threaded discussion group, that kind of thing. Uh, they're fairly low volume, low traffic, but they get their own Sphinx cluster as well. And finally, uh, is what I call the archive Sphinx. Archive is where postings go once they're beyond a few months old. 
they've fallen off the website, they've expired, or the, the owner of the posting has deleted them, and we move them to the archive, which is, you know, all the postings from Craigslist. And so you can imagine that's a very sizable data store. There are very large indexes. Uh, we're talking hundreds of gigabytes of indexes. Uh, well, hundreds of gigabytes of indexes on a given server, uh, terabytes of indexes in total. So that's a whole other beast I could talk about sometime. Um, and it, the other thing with that is it's constantly growing. There are no deletes in the archive. We just add to it all the time. So it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the one biggest thing I want to talk about with real-time Sphinx that's different is um, the way it works is there's two, two fundamental concepts to understand, and I'm going to mention them because I've been, I was bitten in the ass by them <laughs> a couple months ago. Um, when you create an index, a real-time index in Sphinx, and you start inserting stuff, that stuff lives in memory. That index gets created in memory, and it, it's called a RAM chunk. And RAM chunks live in memory because performance in memory is great. Um, st stuff's also written to a little binary log, just like with MySQL, so that if you know the server dies, you can recover, replay the queries, and you get effectively rebuild that RAM chunk. And there's a there's a variable configuration variable called RT memlimit that caps the size of a RAM chunk because you don't want to you don't want to use up all the memory for for your search indexes. So what happens is when a, a RAM chunk gets too big, which means it exceeds the RT memlimit size, it gets written to disk and converted to what's called a disk chunk. Makes sense, right? A disk chunk is is effectively just a regular on disk Sphinx index. It's the same exact format as traditional non real time Sphinx indexes. So what can happen is if you have real time indexes going running over time and they get big enough, some of the stuff in RAM falls off to disk, and then you get a combination of stuff in memory and stuff on disk. And so Querying to find something means checking in memory, but also consulting stuff on disk. Now, the stuff on disk, parts of it end up being cached in memory anyway. But as you can imagine, there's a, there's a performance difference between looking in memory and going to disk to check indexes. And um, as this goes on and on and on, you can end up with a lot of disk chunks. And that increases the amount of time that takes a query to run and so on. And if you don't take care to occasionally go through and perform some maintenance on those disk chunks, what happens is performance starts to get worse and worse and worse, and CPU usage goes up and up and up. Because what's happening is when documents are deleted, Sphinx doesn't delete them immediately if the document isn't in memory still. What it does is if the the index, the data for that document is sitting in a disk chunk, it just makes an entry in, a, in something called a kill list that says, well, that document's dead, we'll clean it up later. So what happens is when you run this query, it goes off, finds a bunch of documents, most of which have been deleted because of our high churn rate, and it has to go through, find all these documents, and then realize most of them have been deleted, filter them out, and show you the resulting set. And the problem we had is we weren't doing adequate, we weren't adequately controlling how many disk chunks we got, and we also weren't performing maintenance on them to clean up those deleted items periodically. And performance got worse and worse and worse, and things would blow up on us. So that was the big sort of learning, the big difference for us from going, going from the old on-disk batch index, batch-built indexes to real-time indexes was having to manage the, set the RAM, the, the size of the RAM chunks appropriately and deal with the disk chunks when they were created. Yes? It won't automatically delete the kill list? It won't automatically delete the kill list because um, that's kind of, that could be an intensive operation. So we schedule it for kind of slow times. Um, the process doesn't notably affect the performance of queries and whatnot on the server. Like for re read queries, it'll block writes for a little while because what happens is when you get multiple disk chunks, the algorithm is very simple. Let's say you've got four disk chunks. It will take the two adjacent disk chunks, merge them and remove deletes, and then take the other two, merge them and remove deletes. So you go from four disk chunks to two, and then you can do it again to go from two to one. Um, but uh, So we just have a cron job that runs that periodically during sort of downtimes or quiet times. That was really the biggest thing we ran into. Uh, other than that, it's been a pretty smooth road. Um, some general lessons with search and some specific to real-time <coughs> search or if you're building a search infrastructure where you want to be able to change things. Um, the first one is stop words. When I first started working on search, we had a list of stop words and whatnot. And once we got the hardware upgrades and all this extra capability, I kind of realized that Google has kind of spoiled it for everyone. Um, we don't have stop words anymore. Stop words are the words that don't get indexed, like uh and the, and you know, really, really, really common words, uh, especially things you find on the web like HTTP and href and stuff like that. 
Um, we just got away, got, you know, did away with all the stop words. We said this is just this is silly because it was causing weird edge cases. Um, we had problems where initially we only indexed words that were two characters or greater, but then that caused other queries to fail. You know, people wanted to search for something like Ford F-150. Well, Sphinx saw that as F and 150. Well, F was a single character word, so that wasn't in the index, so that didn't work. So you're really just searching for Ford 150, which brought up all sorts of random stuff. And it was like, that's just a nightmare. So we just index everything, you know. Index all words, no stop words. Um, and it made our users much happier because people's expectations for search are largely dictated by what Google does for them nowadays. Uh, we added sort of auto-completion for search uh, last year. And that's actually worked out really well too. Reduces typos, lets users quickly get what they want without having to type it. Uh, monitoring was very, very important. Um, with moving to real time, there was more stuff we wanted to monitor, so we just added more and more stuff to our monitoring system to make sure things were being kept up to date. Um, we monitor for disk chunk creation, for example. We want to keep the number of disk chunks down in our servers. Uh, I already talked about the RT mem limit thing, and really keeping it all in RAM was the biggest, single biggest thing that we've tried to do. The more we can keep the stuff in memory, the faster search is going to be, the less we have to worry about, the less hardware we really, really need to do the job. Um, and the last two are kind of administrative things for our purposes, but I found to be just rules that have, have made it so much easier to change things. One is to make re-indexing easy. Um, used, re-indexing used to be a real pain for us. It used to take days to say, I want to change something about our indexing process or I want to add some fields or whatever. I need to go get all the postings and re-index everything. And with a whole bunch of with a whole bunch of code changes and tweaking how we did things, we're to the point now where we can re-index everything in about four hours. Um, so it's just it's so much more productive to be able to do that. Because you can test something out, you don't like it, throw it away, try something else, come back the next day, do a couple iterations till you get it right. And the other one was automatic cloning, which is a machine falls down or gets a disk replaced or something. Make it so it's trivial to get updated data index indexes onto that box from one of its peers in the same cluster. Sphinx doesn't have that natively. We built our own, and it makes things much, much easier. Uh, so I have time for questions. Um, but before I answer questions, I want to say Craigslist is hiring. We're looking for front-end engineers, back-end engineers, network people, just generally smart people that want to hack on stuff. Um, you can come to, come to San Francisco and work at Craigslist. Like I said, small shop like a startup without the risks of a startup. Got lots of money in the bank. That's not a problem. If you're interested at all, send me your resume. Letter Z at Craigslist.org. Easiest email address to remember today. Um, and like I said, I've got lots of swag up here too. If you ask a, t if you ask a question, come up and get a t-shirt. When we're done, I've got the bottle opener, keychain, USB, or USB stick things and stickers. Questions? Yes. Um, two real quick. Um, going on the F-150, uh, is Sphinx smart enough to know the F-150 and F-150 together are the same thing? It is now. There's, there's a feature you can use called uh, blended characters. So you can say when it sees something with a hyphen, index it as F-150 and index it as F-150. Yep. My second question is how does it create Actually, can you, can you just one sec? Why don't, why don't we just wrap up and let everybody leave and then we can ask some oh, questions? Sure. Okay, well let me answer this one last question because I, get I get this question all the time. How does Craigslist make money? Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> we charge for postings in a small number of categories and a small number of cities. Primarily companies hiring people, so job postings and more recently car dealers so they don't spam the crap out of each other on the site. That's how we make money. Thanks. Turn that audio thing off.